on this episode of Civic Cocktail. Homelessness, rapid growth, and a new business tax have things coming to a head in Seattle. This is a regional issue. We cannot afford to wait for the region to find consensus. Looking to us to be an ATM is not the right approach to handle a regional issue. What I still haven't heard yet from business leaders is what the solutions are. Seattle is being squeezed by construction chaos, congestion, and cost overruns. How do we move ahead? We have to build infrastructure for all users, not just drivers. We can't send a big bus everywhere that needs to go. It would be awesome if transit was free. <laughs> it's all coming up on Civic Cocktail. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Civic Cocktail. I'm Joni Balter here this evening to talk about Seattle's head tax. Nice, quiet little topic. <laughs> Joining me tonight is Seattle City Council Member Lorena Gonzalez and Marilyn Strickland, the new president and CEO of the Seattle Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce. Thank you both so much for being here. The journalists who are helping with the questions this evening, Sydney Brownstone, now of KUOW, and David Croman from Crosscut.com. <laughs> We'll start with you, Council Member. Um, you were very much in the middle of the deliberations uh, for the Council with the Mayor and everything on the head tax. Why do you feel this is the right bargain for Seattle? Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Thanks, thanks for um, it's a there. pleasure to be here with um, all of you and I'm looking forward to a productive conversation um, with Marilyn and um, with you. So thank you so much for having us. So. Um, you know, I think um, it's fair to say that every day when each of us walks the street in Seattle, um, or uh, for those of you who drive cars, drive your car, uh, or take the bus, we see the realities facing our city. And it's not a pretty picture. It's not a pretty reality for us. Um, we see uh, tents and we see um, other structures, but more importantly than the things we see, it's the people we see and the faces we see. We see a huge amount of human suffering uh, uh, taking a hold of our streets, um, and we see that. Each of us sees that every single day um, and moment that we're walking through um, our city. And, uh, and that was what motivated me to want to try to wrestle with what a solution could look like to address uh, the realities of the scale of the problem as it relates to folks who are um, suffering every day on our streets as a result of um, not having a home to live in. And uh, uh, that's what motivated me to want to engage in this conversation. It became pretty clear to me that what we needed was um, some additional revenue to be able to, to really uh, meet the uh, scale of, of the need that is confronting our city. And, um, and really, you know, to me, what that meant was um, what levers could we pull both in terms of uh, existing efficiencies we can find in terms of how we spend yes. money currently, um, but also uh, is the amount of money that we're currently spending in this area enough? And the reality is, is we just don't have a lot of tools available to us as, as a city and uh, the head tax was one of the few tools left to us um, that didn't result in us putting burden on uh, homeowners, renters, and consumers. Marilyn Strickland, the Seattle's head tax has now been called the headache tax. No matter what side of the debate you're on, nobody seems particularly happy. Why is that? Well, I think here in Seattle, well, first of all, I want to thank City Club for hosting this and for having me here. This is my debut at Seattle City Club. And yeah. I also always want to make sure that I acknowledge that I thank Councilmember Gonzalez for her service. I had the opportunity to serve as an elected official, and the work is not easy. So even if we're not agreeing on something specifically, thank you for your service. Thank you. So as far as why the jobs tax is controversial to a lot of people, here in this region, we are experiencing the type of growth that we never imagined. 20 years ago, we never thought that we would have 1,000 people moving to King County every single week. We weren't prepared for it from a housing standpoint, from a transportation standpoint. But we also know that Seattle voters tend to be very generous when it comes to saying yes to taxes. And there's a point where I think people are now saying to themselves, how many more taxes can we pay? And even though people will say this is a tax on employers, 
it can definitely have an effect on people every single day. They will have to pass the costs along. And I think it's much a conversation about people not being pleased with the consistent taxing that they're seeing as much as the actual situation that they're trying to handle. But I want to make sure we say something here. This is a regional issue. I ride the bus in from Seattle. I drive in from Tacoma. And you see this in every single city up and down the I-5 corridor. This is a regional issue. So instead of having Seattle take on a disproportionate responsibility, let's take a regional approach, come together, and figure out how we can best resolve this issue. And if we need more revenue, let's do that. But let's have a plan first. Council Member, what has been the reaction in your offices? Are people flooding the phone lines? Are they calling to, to congratulate or to complain? What, what kind of response have you gotten? I mean, I think, it's, I, I think that it's fair to say that it's been um, you know, very mixed. We've, we've been getting um, postcards thanking us for passing the head tax and for um, continuing to stay committed to uh, the passage of that policy and you know we've gotten emails and calls from folks who um, think that it, we should pursue a different um, avenue but I think that um, ultimately what I continue to hear from uh, people that I talk to about this issue is that they recognize that this is a complex um, and profound issue that is of humanitarian crisis and I think that regardless of how people feel about this tax, they feel that there need to be clear solutions on how we address uh, the realities of homelessness. And so, um, you know, I think I, I, I want to spend my time this evening talking about things that I think we have common ground on mm -hmm. and hopefully beginning a conversation as a city and as civic leaders within this city about how we can identify some positive solutions to move us forward on this issue. So, Marilyn Strickland, the business community cannot just turn its head on this. So, if not the head tax, what is the business community's solution? How are they going to help us? This is a problem, and folks do need the services. Right. There's no denying there's a problem. We can look around every day and see it. And this problem didn't happen in the last year or the last two years. It's been compounding and building up for a long time. But business does have a role to play and we need to define what that role is. One of the best things that we can do as businesses is to employ people. There are people who are homeless who are employed, that is an absolute fact, but there are people who are underemployed and they have an opportunity to move up the wage progression scale. There are people who don't have jobs and a lot of the people I represent actually provide jobs for people and give them a second chance. So let's talk about the business community's specific role in this. We can employ people, we can work with the city council to ask ourselves one important question, what are the barriers to adding more housing to Seattle? What can we do together to make that happen? Are there things we can do together in Olympia to talk about legislation we need from the state legislature? So there are a lot of things we can do together, but the business community feels as though looking to us to be an ATM is not the right approach to handle a regional issue. So the business community is also planning to recall this measure. They're gathering a lot of signatures all, all around. Um, how do you think that helps the situation if it does help the situation? So, you know, the referendum campaign is something that really came up from the grassroots. You had small businesses and medium-sized businesses and large businesses get together to say that they were not pleased with the passage of the jobs tax. And even after it was passed, you know, our message didn't change. We do not believe that a tax on jobs is the way to address a regional issue. So people started gathering signatures. And you know, I can tell you anecdotally that people have been volunteering to do this work as well. And so as people start to gather signatures and something gets on the ballot, and in all they're likelihood- They're volunteering, but there's also pay, plenty oh, of paid absolutely. signature Absolutely, there are lots of paid signature gatherers, make right. no mistake. Yeah. But people actually are volunteering for it well. And there will be something on the ballot in November. They're going to make their threshold. So the question I think to us becomes, okay, do we continue to have these contentious fights or do we somehow sit down together, take the time to listen to each other and say, let's come up with solutions first, let's test them out, let's get people off the street with what we can do and then talk about new revenue, but we're doing it in the wrong order. So council member, if she just said that they, they expect something to be on the ballot, if something's on the ballot, if this is called back, um, number one, what does that say to the council members who worked hard on this? And what would be the next step if the voters go along with them? So there's a lot to unpack um, in what has just been said. So let me, let me see if I can do that um, and do it as, as, as concisely as I can. So um, 
you know, I think Meryl and I clearly have a different definition of what grassroots is. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, grassroots is really about empowering communities to make change uh, for themselves. And we see that represented in, in labor movements. We see that represented in the immigrant rights movement. We see that represented in uh, the movement to fight for marriage equality and for a whole host of other issues. But let, let's, let's be really clear here that the campaign to repeal this law is funded by major, major corporations at a huge amount of money. So we have donations coming in to this repeal effort to the tune of about $50,000 on the top end. That's not grassroots from my perspective. So I think it's important for us in the, in the context of this conversation to get accurate information out. That's a fact um, in terms of who is funding the repeal effort. Now, I will say that I am really disappointed that we are in a position now where we worked very hard as council members to create a process and an opportunity to engage in conversation with business leaders. And that process was the Progressive Revenue Task Force. And it was overtly and expressly boycotted by members of the business community, including the chamber. Now, I am always going to be interested in having conversations with business. I'm absolutely continue to be committed to that. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that what I still haven't heard yet from business leaders is what the solutions are. Where can you say yes? Is it on a capital gains tax? Is it on a statewide income tax referendum? Is it on an increase in the business and occupation tax? What is the thing that we can say yes to? I just continue to hear offers about uh, continuing to, co to have a conversation, but I have, a, I have there, there's an urgency of now. We have, a, we have a crisis on our streets now, and we need solutions now, not tomorrow, and we cannot afford to wait for the region to find consensus on an issue that the city of Seattle owns 73% of. I'm gonna bring in David Croman. Yeah, Marilyn, um I think it was in the last week, Moody's Analytics came out with a report that found, um, they, they said that the employee tax would actually be a credit positive for Seattle. And mm -hmm. they said that the effect of the tax would be limited, sort of considering its size and the, the presence of large corporations in this city. Do you buy, do you buy that? Moody Analytics is Moody Analytics. So if they think that that is their opinion, they're entitled to their opinion. But I think one thing I want to point out here, and I want to answer something that the council member said. She said that this is not a grassroots effort. There is nothing more grassroots than voters deciding what they want to do. And when we think about the opportunity we have here, yes, the economy is doing well here in Seattle, and we're very fortunate in that respect. But we cannot take this prosperity for granted because businesses of all sizes employ a lot of people. And yes, there are large businesses who have the muscle and the resources to get something on the ballot. But at the end of the day, there's nothing more grassroots than asking voters what they think about something. But you disagree. Do you disagree with the notion that this will have a limited impact, as Moody's Analytics found? You know what? I don't know what the impact will be, to be honest with you. So Moody's Analytics is a reputable organization. This is their analysis. But people do all kinds of analyses. Sydney Brownstone. I have another question for Marilyn. So two weeks before the head tax, the city budget office gave a presentation to council mm -hmm. in which they showed two things. One, the construction boom was cooling off, and two, the city was depleting its general fund, in part because of past one-time uh, spending measures on homelessness. So the budget office projected that we're actually going to head into a deficit in 2019 and 2020, which puts pressure on possible programs like the Immigrant Legal Defense Fund or the Office of Labor Standards Enforcement. Um, if you were the mayor of Seattle, looking at these budget projections right. and the head tax referendum were to pass, meaning no head tax, how would you raise revenue outside of the head tax or which programs or departments would you cut so that the city doesn't go into the red? Yeah, so during the recession when I was mayor of Tacoma, we had to let go of 200 some odd people. And it was a really hard, horrible situation. And going through a recession and having to scale back on services is never anything anyone wants to do. It's really easy to say yes to everything. But at some point, you have to show some discipline from a fiscal standpoint. And when we talk about what resources are there for a city, I can't think of a city in the Puget Sound region that has had a larger abundance of revenues over the past five years. So the conversation really for me is, what did we do in the past five years to show discipline, planning for a possible downturn? And if there are places we can look, I would say look at IT departments. I would say do a complete scrubbing of the entire budget and look for <laughs> revenue savings. 
that means you have to make some hard decisions about things as well. But the opportunity to look at where you find new revenues exists in a $1.2 billion city budget that has gotten really large over five years. And so it's a conversation about priorities and making some really, really hard choices. But if we talk about the homeless situation as a true emergency, then we need to treat it like one. And it hasn't been treated like one for five years here. So I'll just say to the audience, if you want to join us, uh, line up with Gabby, uh, and we'll keep going here. Uh, Councilmember Gonzalez, uh, you and I talked about this. Uh, we met yesterday. Um, is the reaction to the head tax all about the head tax, or is it about something else? It has this feeling that it has multiple uh, sources of frustration packed into some of the reaction. Um, you know, I think that at the... Um, End of the day, you know, I think that I, I, I think that the, this conversation around the head tax is, is serving as a vehicle for um, for other concerns about yeah. um, the state of our city, the state of um, our state, and frankly, the state of our nation. Yeah. And um, and I think that that is um, scary, frankly. And I think that we as leaders have a huge role to play to re insert civility into our conversations and to really um, have a conversation about what it means to tackle some of the most complex issues in our society. And the reality is, is that homelessness is not just about not having a home. Right. It's about income inequality. It's about how institutional racism mm -hmm. plays out in our systems every day as we try to move around as people of color and as women in this city. And, uh, and, and, it's, and it's about income inequality. It's about the reality that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. And that is, correlates with the uh, evisceration of unions and living wage jobs across the country. And we are not an exception here in the city of Seattle. And I think that what we are hearing as part of this conversation is really ultimately about those bigger societal issues that are facing our city that this, and that our city has very limited tools as a city to, uh, to, really, to really solve for. Go ahead, David. Council Member, we uh, put up a story this afternoon actually showing some, some recent polling that suggests that over the last about a year and a half, Seattle voters are becoming markedly less interested in taxing themselves mm -hmm. um, and a sort of waning faith in city government that it is going to make good use of those dollars. What's I mean? What's changed over the last year? Have you felt that change? And um, how do you respond to that sort of losing of faith that the, the city is going to spend dollars well? You know, I think it's hard to have this conversation <laughs> without um, acknowledging that we had a tough year as a city last year. Um, we had a uh, mayoral scandal that resulted in an abrupt resignation of um, a mayor that scandal came out halfway through the year. Um, and it's also uh, in the context of the nation electing uh, Donald Trump and seeing what's happening at the federal level and how some of those policies are trickling down to states like the state of Washington and the city of Seattle. Um, and so I think that, that when I think about this issue, I think about the um, environment as a whole, not just here in our bubble in Seattle and King County, but how uh, we as a community um, and as a nation really um, are struggling with what I think is a little bit of a moral crisis in terms of how will we define ourselves. And I think it's fair to say that this is a redefining moment for the city of Seattle. And my hope is, is that we can define ourselves in a way that will continue to be true to what I believe Seattle's progressive values uh, should be and ought to be and have always been. And, um, you know, if the voters have a different say on that, then, uh, you know, it won't be the first time that, um, that uh, society will have taken a position that hasn't um, quite caught up with elected officials or policymakers. I'm going to bring in the audience. Hey there. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much. I'm Howard Wright from Seattle Hospitality Group. And I want to thank the council and the council member for trying to find solutions to this challenge. But I don't see this as a solution. I see this as a penalty. And I think that business can provide jobs. Jobs are part of the solution to homelessness. So I do see, I see this as a penalty that I, I think is wrong. 
and I do think that there, the recall of the referendum will pass. I look at this, this, this head tax as the equivalent of would you tax food banks for trying to feed the hungry? I don't think we would. I don't think any of us would. I don't think there's anyone here in this room who's more of a progressive employer than I, and I think that this is wrong. I think that you have penalized solutions by the business community. Thank you. Go ahead, Sydney. I had another question jumping off of David's for Council Member Gonzalez. Um, so the voters have concerns about how the city is going to spend its money. Uh, you said that the business community did not want to uh, collaborate with the Progressive Revenue Task Force and the first spending plan that, the, that came out of that task force would have built 1,100 units of new housing. The current spending plan that we have would create 591 and there are somewhere between 11,000 and 14,000 people living without homes in Seattle and King County. How do you overcome that gap? Um, well, I think um, that's, that's, that is, I think, where some of the um, approaches around how we can partner with King County and with the state come into role, um, into play. You know, we acknowledge that we are not going to be able to solve the entire issue related to homelessness with one single tax. That's, that's just, I've never said that and I would never say that because that's just not true. And, uh, but I do think that the passage of the employee hours tax, which would, have gener which would generate $47 million a year roughly, um, is a measurable down payment on what we can do to meet our own responsibility as the city of Seattle in addressing the issues related to uh, the lack of affordable housing for people experiencing homelessness and on the services that need to be funded and on the shelter capacity that needs to be expanded. Now, last week, I had an opportunity to sit, to stand with Mayor Durkin at a press conference. Uh, um, and at that press conference, uh, she announced that there would be a 25% increase on shelter capacity. In order to continue to follow through on that uh, promise of shelter capacity, we need to have a revenue source to support that. And the revenue source that is currently being relied on to be able to do that 25% shelter capacity increase is on the head tax. So uh, if we lose the head tax, then we will be where we're at today. Audience. A question for Council Member Gonzalez. Where in the last year or two has the uh, City Council found to cut expenses to make room in the budget for homelessness? solutions? So we make um, tough choices all the time and uh, we have our budget process and uh, every fall we go through that process and identify things that should either continue to have funding or uh, lose funding. So we, you know, I, I, I can't sit here and like give you a verbatim green sheet where something was um, was was reduced, but but last year, for example, during this debate, and where the head tax was being proposed, there were many um, uh, services that were being proposed to be funded through a head tax in the fall um, that were unable to be funded because we didn't have the revenue source for it. Marilyn, um, some of the angst about about all of this has to do with the way the money will be spent. And I understand that some private companies have said that they would privately help with the homelessness problem, but they don't want to work with the city, which they consider ineffective. Okay, that's news to me. But, okay. All right. <laughs> but if that's but the case, I imagine that they probably are looking for ways to add to the stock of affordable housing that exists with, for example, their current projects that are being built. So could part of that be allocated for affordable housing? But I, I'm sorry, Joni, I'm not familiar with that assertion. All right, we'll bring in. Um, <clears throat> oh, thank you. Uh, pr there are three things I think are wrong. First of all, the Amazon, and it, it's a drop in the bucket for them. But they are doing a lot for Mary's Place and things like that, and they will do more, I'm sure. But for a company like Wajemeyer, who just is affected by this, that cuts into their employees' raises and even the number of employees they hire. Secondly, um, there, the companies, as I say, will do some more. Paul Allen just offered a big amount of money, but the city's 
turned it down because their regulations don't fit his project of the little houses on top of each other. And finally, um, the problem with the homeless is not uh, so much beds. I heard there were a lot of beds at, at Salvation Army that have been empty because people have to give up their alcohol and so forth. But addiction and mental health are two of the major things that will keep people always continually. Um, Who did you want to um, answer this? Either one. So, so, so I'll take it. And okay. um, I'm kind of alternating between putting on my chamber hat and my mayor hat. So as Councilmember Gonzalez said, the homeless population is not a monolith. And people find themselves homeless for a variety of reasons. For some people, it's job loss, which led to a spiral of becoming unhoused. There are people who are fleeing domestic violence. There are youth who are homeless. I mean, it, it, it's not, you just can't stereotype. And then there are people who are really the chronically homeless who are the hardest to serve. And so it's a variety of folks. But I think to your point earlier, the idea that there are companies in Seattle who are just doing nothing and turning a blind eye to this is not true. People are doing good work and they want to do it voluntarily. And so I think the bigger question is how do we come together and say, what are some solutions we can do? You know, is there a way we can expedite permitting and move affordable housing and shelters to the very front of the line? I mean, there are things that we can do internally, but also think about the private sector, the public sector, all working together. And to be honest, you know, we're not going to address this issue in a short period of time. This was decades in the making with a lot of policies ranging from divesting in mental health and not backfilling that at a local level. So it's a very complicated issue, but there are things we can do to try and stabilize people who are in the streets now and how do we work together to prioritize and triage those folks and then work on the long-term solution of permanent for permanent supportive housing and more affordable housing yes of course it takes money to build stuff that is a given but we need a plan and we need the public to have trust that we're going to do what we say we're going to do. So I have two things to say, and I know you're trying to move us along, I can tell. So one thing that I think is really important is that privatizing government functions is not the right way to go, in my opinion. Um, government has an important function to play in addressing societal problems. That's why government exists. And contracting out our obligation to meet the minimum social welfare needs of those most vulnerable in our community is, I don't think, the right direction. Now, that being said, I, I absolutely appreciate uh, philanthropy in our community. And I think that that has a role. But at the end of the day, it is a, uh, a small role in comparison to what city governments and state governments' obligation is to uh, fulfill its, its mandate as a government, uh, as a government entity. Um, and then secondly, I would just say that, you know, Seattle and King County and government in general s all suffer from the same problem, which is that they want to talk about things to death, right. right? And we do that while knowing that last year in the city of Seattle, 169 people died in our city as homeless people in our city. I feel like we have researched this, we have studied this, we have analyzed this, we have identified solutions, and what we have not done is identified money to implement all of these good ideas, resources to do that, and we, we have not had a sense of urgency around it. We declared as a county and as a city a state of emergency, a state of emergency five years ago, yep it came with a total of $5 million. Something that is really an emergency doesn't just receive funding of $5 million. There's so many more questions to ask, but we, we have to leave it there. We have been talking with Marilyn Strickland, CEO of the Seattle Chamber, and Council Member Lorena Gonzalez, and we're coming back to go deep on Seattle's transportation challenges. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. about the city's pressing transportation issues. With us tonight is Seattle Deputy Mayor Shafali Ranganathan, Rob Gannon, General Manager of Metro Transit, and Carla Salter, the bus rider who writes the Seattle Bus Chip blog. Thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. Uh, 
We'll start like this. Uh, what do you, each of you think is the number one transportation problem facing us right now, and what is the solution? And we'll start with you, Deputy Mayor. Um, so thank you, Joni, for having thank you. Um, me on your show. I, you know, for, for the city of Seattle and for Mayor Durkin, I think our biggest challenge is making sure we deliver on the things that we say that we will. So basic services, she's talked a lot about being back to basics. Uh, with the growth, we have seen significant mobility challenges. I had my own transportation fail getting here. Um, oh, that's so perfect. It's perfect and ironic. We have video uh, of it, of course. Uh, all at once. Uh, but I think the reality is that uh, we have to figure out to how we're going to build and operate a system that's uh, safe, that's connected, that's affordable and multimodal because uh, our region and how we move is shifting, so we have to figure that out. Rob. Joni, thank you. Um, it's nice to be uh, flanked by two such excellent uh, colleagues. The biggest challenge that I think the region faces, that we face as an agency, is how do we bring service to the communities right now? How can we grow our service to meet ever-increasing demand? How do we do that in a way that is responsive to what a community needs, to what a commuter needs? And how do we do it that takes advantage of current technologies and evolving infrastructure needs? It's a little too easy to blame the biggest challenge on congestion, though that certainly impacts us. But what we really need to do is become more adaptable as an agency and adapt as the region is growing and fluctuating um, and be responsive and, and be centered on what our customers need and what they might need in the future. Carla. Okay, well, obviously there are a lot of transportation challenges happening right now, but I would actually, um, my answer one. I think is gonna go back to the conversation we had previously. I'm gonna say housing. So right now we're building a lot of great trans transportation infrastructure, public transit infrastructure, um, but people can't afford to live near public transit anymore. So we need to be building affordable housing near transit amenities. Thanks. Uh, Deputy Mayor, Seattle voters have read too many transportation stories that should begin with the word whoops. And I don't mean the, the old fashioned one here in Seattle. <laughs> um, many projects move Seattle, the streetcar, they're over budget, some items promised are not gonna be delivered. Uh, what do you say to that? And I should point out to the audience, she is really new in her job. <laughs> so while it's probably not your fault, it's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> The best kind of problem, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's a fair question, and I think that, so when Mayor Durkin came into uh, public office, the first thing she asked of the new director of, um, of transportation, Jaron Sparman, was go look under the hood. Um, go make sure that the projects are on time, they are where they need to be, and uh, that, you know, part of her what guides her is not only that we deliver these projects and we do it in a way that's uh, inclusive, but it's also how are we a prudent steward of public dollars? And so we did, and you know, it, it was mixed. And I think that you saw that in the Seattle Times with the streetcar and with uh, Move Seattle. Um, and it was an effort to be transparent, right? Because part of it is that We'd rather tell you the bad news and work with you to fix that problem than just, you know, at the end of a nine-year levy, say, whoops, sorry, couldn't deliver. And I think this is, uh, this is a painful time for the department. They are working very hard to uh, realign and get us back on track. Uh, and I will tell you that Mayor Durkin and I and the administration are fully committed to doing the very best that we can to deliver these projects uh, in a way that makes sense for, the, for our continually changing city. So some facts get um, <clears throat> sort of stuck. People can only know that one fact. And one that really bothers a lot of people is the $12 million per mile bicycle lanes. So I wondered, and again, not your fault, but, but you're on your plate there at least. Um, you know, what does a $12 million per mile bike lane look like, and how is that different from the national average of 130,000 per mile bike lane? So let's talk what about What do they do? I mean, what does it have in bike it? Lanes. Um, no, they're not magical. Uh, but here's the deal. Headlines are catchy and they're clickbait, but they don't tell the full story. 
Um, that project that was $12 million bike lane was actually a multimodal project. So what that means is uh, we redid all the signals on 2nd Avenue, so that was half the cost. Uh, and the reason we did that was not just because it's a safety issue. Uh, a month before we put the bike lane in, a young mother was um, hit and killed on her bicycle, turning. And so we put those, those projects in to make sure that it's safe for all users. And you know, when you go in and you dig up a street to do something, we try to do other projects. And so- What do you mean? So like they were like redoing yes, they the were, entire street? They were redoing- Because a bike lane, I mean, I'm, and so, I don't know what's in there. The redo when SDOT goes in to do a project, we try to make sure that we are streamlining so you're not impacting communities over and over, right? So if you go in to repave and SBU, you know, Seattle Public Utilities needs to, to do, in, do some maintenance work, they'll try to do it together. Um, sometimes those costs get conflated when you read a headline. But, I, you know, I think the part of what we are but trying to But there's nothing wrong with that story. No, 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 there was that, in fact, I was just telling someone, uh, I think Mike Lindblom wrote that story. Uh, that was the first time that um, someone had articulated what goes into those projects, and I thought it was actually a really balanced story. I think the point that I'm trying to make here is that, uh, one, we have to build infrastructure for all users, not just drivers, because we have people who are on bikes and on transit and who are walking. And so when we go in and try to do these improvements, we're not thinking about just one user. So what you see as a cost is, is multiple projects that have been rolled into one project to try to make it more effective, more efficient, and more convenient. Now, can we do a better job of, of uh, estimating and can we do a better job of cutting down on those costs, of course, and that's exactly what the department's doing right now. And so you were alluding to this uh, a few minutes ago. The Seattle Transportation Department will get an overhaul and needs one, yes? And, and sort of what are you looking for in the, in the next department? Um, it's in progress, and I, you know, overhaul um, is, a, is a big word. I think what we're trying to make sure is that people are set up for success in the department and the right people are in the right jobs. Uh, and I think also realigning the department's priorities. Uh, you know, I think there is a little bit of the department lost its way. And what we want to make sure is that uh, the department is supported, the people who are doing this work every day, working really hard, feel like they are working towards something and that they have good direction from the mayor's office on these things. So yes, it's in progress. And uh, you know, as you all know, we are in looking for the next direction of this department. Yes. We are seeking public input on this. And we want it to be a really thoughtful, deliberative process because whoever will run this department uh, is charged with a very challenging task, quite frankly. We are growing quickly. We have these investments. And people are impatient. You want to see progress now. So how do we bring that together, but also someone who, that can inspire and lead a city and bring real solutions to the table? So Rob Gannon, um Good news on transportation. Seattle is a pr proud bus town. We, um, we buck the trend. Uh, in recent years, many other cities have seen a decline in ridership uh, due to gas prices, which they're not low now, but they were low when some of this research was done, uh, Uber and Lyft, and just some um, transit system breakdowns. Uh, please explain, sort of, there's a chart that uh, some of your staff wanted me uh, to kind of highlight, but Seattle really does look different when it comes to bus ridership. It does. So of the <clears throat> 10 largest transit agencies in the country, um, only two of them have seen year over year growing ridership, while everything else is in single digit or double digit decline. So Seattle and who else? Uh, Seattle and San Francisco Rail. Right. So we're in some elite company. Mm -hmm. um, and that's part of our challenge, but that's also part of a, a very privileged position we occupy right now. I say it's a challenge because we want to maintain that position and continue to grow our services because we know more people are coming to the city and the region, more jobs, more people are dependent on public transportation to get where they need to go, school, work, opportunity, whatever it may be. But it's also a position of privilege, right? Because it's easy for me to stay up here and say, isn't Metro great? Isn't our region great? Look how we've grown ridership. But it's not all accruing to us. It's a region that is contributing to a way of life that invites people in. It is a set of economic opportunities that are favorable. And it is a community at its core that supports the concept and the mission of public transportation. But we're, 
some of our buses are still super crowded and still leaving people behind, just passing them. So what are you doing about that part of it? Joni, that feels like a setup. <laughs> Possibly. You're right. Um, <laughs> crowding and reliability are our two biggest challenges, right? We, and it hurts us as much as it is difficult for our riders. One of the things we're trying to do is partner with the city and other jurisdictions in finding out where those crowded routes are and target our service hour investments to relieve crowding and improve overall reliability. We're trying to expand the span of our service, the number of buses that are on routes, the frequency with which they come. Uh, all of those things will help crowding and reliability, but all of it helps build a more robust transit system. We also want to integrate with other options, right? One of the big challenges we face is how do we get people to and from that last mile, first and last mile delivery? We can't send a big bus everywhere that needs to go. We have to take advantage of the light rail system. We have to take advantage of the growing streetcar system. And we also have to look at other modal options or other mobility options and demonstrate to our region that we can integrate all of these for a more seamless and effective rider experience. So Carla, you have been um, riding and documenting your ridership for, for many years now. What riders' concerns um, are missing from the current discussion? Well, I think there's a couple of things. I should say first that I've been riding buses in Seattle my entire life and I haven't owned a car in 15 years and this is actually really a golden time. I mean, for my family at least, things are a lot better than they were even five years ago, bus-wise. But I would um, say that... How so? Like what's something measurable or well, noticeable or something? Uh, frequency <laughs> is... There's a, I mean, you know, a few years ago we were talking about massively cutting service and the city decided, we, this, we voted on the Seattle Transportation Benefit District, and the city decided to invest in um, more routes, and um, there's a lot more frequency on the route. So even though we're kind of, riders are expected to transfer more, there's, you don't, except in the case when there's really bad traffic, you're not gonna be waiting 25 minutes for a bus, or you're usually not, a lot, a lot less often. Um, so the frequency is great. Um, I would say some concerns. Uh, one for me is transfer points, uh, especially transferring from bus to light rail, like at Mount Baker Transit Center and even up at UW. Transfers are difficult, and, and um, just transfer points in general aren't always safe. They're not set back from the street. You gotta cross a lot of streets. That kind of stuff is frustrating. And I think the fare system is frustrating, especially for families. How so? Well, um, I mean, transit's expensive. Uh, I, I'm really glad about the low-income fare, and that has helped a lot. That's, that, I mean, that's, that's a great uh, thing that Seattle offers, but the bus fare peak is two seventy-five. dollars so, um, And for kids, I have, a, I have kids, and so it's $1.50 each way for your kids. Not only that, but in terms of the logistics of paying for young kids who aren't really traveling by themselves yet, you know, do you have a whole bunch of passes that you, who keeps track of them? And, you try to tell a bus driver that you want to pay for one adult and two kids or one adult and three kids and they just kind of look at you blankly because they've got to. <laughs> so, um, and, and I know now that, you know, we're, we're already talking about the next version of ORCA, ORCA 2.0, which means, you know, new technology, new software, new infrastructure, new marketing campaign, all these costs associated with it and, and, and new adoption. So I f it almost feels like, well, how much is fare collection actually costing us, you know, and it, does it make sense? Yeah. It would be awesome if transit was free. <laughs> so, um, audience, if you want to join us, same, same drill. Um, it's, it, it'll, the time will run away if you don't uh, line up, if, if you do, in fact, have a question. But Sydney Brownstone is first. Yes, so I actually have a yes, no question for all three panelists. Um, the King County Auditor put out a report showing that fair enforcement was disproportionately <laughs> affecting um, homeless people. Um, which could, can result in criminal charges eventually, can result in misdemeanors. And a minority of people even paid the fines. This costs hundreds of thousands of dollars in the court system to process. So should not being able to pay for the public bus result in criminal prosecution? Should that be a possibility? Yes or no? No. 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 <laughs> what are you going to do about Some it? Some get longer. <laughs> So that seems like my question. Uh, what are we going to do about it? Um, so one, I want to be clear that we took the auditor's report very seriously, and we've already engaged with a community of advocates and tried to figure out how can we do something that supports our riders and gets them to ride in a safe and efficient and effective way such that they can afford it. 
right? So how can we help people get on board rather than find them or some other punitive measure? We're going to look at how can our fair enforcement um, be fair advocates rather than enforcement. We're going to look at opportunities to expand Orca Lift. We're going to partner with um, others in King County and the city of Seattle to expand opportunities to ride the system. Uh, fundamentally, there's a lot of work that has to be done, uh, but we are committed to doing it. And I think as well, what we have to understand is uh, recovering some portion of a fare to assist in our revenue stream is really important. Right? So as much as I would like to give away uh, every transit ride and have a free system, um, it is an important part of our overall revenue picture. But we're committed to working on it, and I can match Carla's emphasis and say no, right? We, we should not be criminally prosecuting people for fare evasion. I guess this is for Rob and the deputy mayor. There was the King County Metro has had some struggles of keeping up with hiring writers and, and getting enough buses. And as a result, there's been some discussion about private contracting. Councilmember Gonzalez in the last panel expressed concerns about privatizing government functions. What can King County do to get enough drivers or enough buses? And is private contracting a good idea? Is this an idea that should be taken seriously? And either either one of you can start. Go first. <laughs> um, you know. So, um, do you want me to go first? Okay. <laughs> so we need to hire operators as fast as we can. And I just would start by saying that hiring operators in the Seattle region in King County means you're combating uh, three or four percent overall unemployment rate. So it's a very competitive market. That's one of our challenges. We can buy buses almost fast enough to keep up with demand, but putting them into service becomes a challenge um, because we have to have the routes and the frequency and the, and the ability to put them into play. The bigger challenge that we really face, however, is bus-based capacity, right? It's not just an operator in the seat and driving it. It's maintaining the bus, having the physical space to bring it in for servicing and getting it back out. And then to one of Carla's earlier points, it's making sure that in addition to addressing crowding and reliability, we're also attending to passenger amenities at transfer points. All of those things combined make it for a pretty complicated transit system. Good partnership with the City of Seattle helps us focus where we should be investing our efforts. We also have to keep in mind that if everything is Seattle focused, uh, we're leaving 38 other jurisdictions wondering how are we improving service for them. So we're trying to grow as fast as we can. Operators are just one of our challenges. And Deputy Mayor, on the private privatization contracting, does that make sense? You know, this is a this is a unique problem to have, right? That the demand is outstripping our ability to actually supply it. Um, we are working very closely with King County on this potential pilot to uh, to use contract service. You know, I think really. Uh, there are two principles that we're thinking about as, well, there's more, but really as we think about this is how do we complement the service that Metro provides? Um, how do we make sure that those jobs are good wage jobs? Because, uh, you know, King County bus driver is a good wage job and we should be finding ways to get more people to do it quickly. Uh, and the third piece is there are some neighborhoods and some places where it actually doesn't make sense to run a 40-foot bus uh, simply because those are more expensive to operate. Can we do, uh, you know, east-west connections in Seattle are not great and can we bring service quickly online that will support Metro in its goal to expand coverage but also make sure that we're doing it in partnership with them. So, you know, I think that our motto is very much we're not going to go it alone, we're going to work with them and work with labor and other community partners to, uh, to sort of right size solutions for communities and because the one size, the 40 foot size fits all it doesn't always work for. Uh, for certain communities. Audience, if you're interested in joining, we're gonna run out of time here. Um, Carla, nobody likes this question, um, but I, we have to talk about it. It's about bad bus conduct. Um, I was about to ride the bus one day, and uh, just before I left, I cracked open my newspaper, and the headline of one of the stories was, Man Lights Woman's Hair on Fire on the Number 7. Um, that was my bus. Um, so I hesitated, I, I did ride the bus, but uh, how do you get around a perception and sometimes a reality that uh, bad things happen on the buses? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, first of all, um, 
I love the seven. <laughs> I ride that bus a lot. But I think, um, I think first we should say that people behave badly. People behave badly on buses and in other parts, you know, in malls and on the street and other, other places. And I think sort of the idea of sort of a concentration of people from your community makes some people nervous because, yes, sometimes you're going to witness unpleasant things, just like you will anytime you're around crowds of people. And I would say, yes, uh, just like everyone else, I've experienced my, my share of unpleasant experiences. But I would say on balance, I mean, compared to the beauty of sharing a ride with the members of my community, I mean, there's no contest. You know, there's, there's been so, I've had so many experiences where, you know, I, I just have a sort of a, a brief glimpse into someone's life, or one of us helps the other one, or I learn something I didn't know before. And I feel like that beauty um, means so much to my life and who I am, and even my kids. You know, we, I, I teach them to set and respect boundaries and to, to understand that everyone belongs. And I feel like that being um, with humanity is complicated, and it can be hard sometimes. But it's worth it. Audience, hi. Hello. Hey, thank you. <clears throat> I want to go back to the cost issue and the way some of the costs on these projects have ballooned. It, it feels like, and thank you for explaining why it came to $12 million a mile, but it feels like so much of that should have been anticipated and included in the estimate to begin with. <laughs> Similarly, with the tram line on, on First Avenue, so much of those additional costs should have been anticipated. It almost feels like the costs are being deliberately lowballed so that they don't cause a controversy and only become apparent once the project is already underway. How do you stop that from happening? How do you get realistic estimates for these projects? So that's part of the what's that's part of the work that's underway is how do we make sure that we are getting our cost estimating to a place where there are no surprises? You know, I think the other thing that didn't hasn't been addressed in this conversation is that we are in the midst of a building boom, and any public agency or private developer right now is competing for resources, whether that's laborers or the cost of materials, and construction costs are escalating. So, you know, these project estimates build in some of that, but you know, what we're looking at right now, in terms of what's coming in, in terms of bids, uh, I think that's just a challenge of the environment that we are in, that there are cranes everywhere and we're competing for limited resources. But to your point of can we do a better job and how do we make sure that we as a city are continuing to steward these dollars well, absolutely, you'll find no disagreement from me that we need to continue to put uh, protections in place that we don't end up with projects being so over budget that they are surprises in the newspaper. Deputy Mayor, what are we going to do about the First Avenue streetcar? It's on pause right now. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to get rid of it altogether? <laughs> no comment. Um, so, so for wait, no those, of, those of You're you who are comment. not tracking this project, um, <laughs> Mayor Durkin has uh, placed a pause on this project. It's a streetcar that will connect the other two streetcars, South Lake Union and the one that goes to First Hill on First Avenue. Uh, and the reason she did that was because of this issue of cost estimates and wanting to make sure that uh, this expensive project uh, that we get it right. Um, and this is to being the prudent mayor. I think she, we are going down a path uh, where we want to make sure that we have those estimates right and that we have the timelines right. And so rather than get to a place of, well, we can't do anything about this, uh, what we're in the midst now uh, is a review to make sure that those numbers both on the capital side to build it and to operate it are uh, in line with where they need to be uh, in terms of being realistic. Rob, um, I was talking to some um, a mayor of a Northern California city, a Silicon Valley city, and you know some of those places use um, a lot of the corporate buses. We use some of them too. Would it be good for us if um, if we use more of those, or would they just add to clogging up the streets? I think more in the right way is something that we can explore, right? So. Um, if we just refer to them generically as an employer shuttle, if a single employer sends their shuttle back and forth and services only their employees, that fulfills one need. Um, but it often travels back and forth without a full load. We're going to try to work with large employers to figure out how can we do a shared shuttle system 
that allows them to maximize their dollars, but also partner with us in I mean, organizing. So the public those. would be able to write some of those, or no? You know? So that's a different category, right? But if employers can use their shuttles more efficiently, multiple employers using them, then that's bearing a share of the public transportation burden. If we can also look at other transit options that aren't, as Shafali said, 40 and 60 foot buses, that organize uh, direct routes and opportunities for people to get where they need to go, that's, that's a good solution too. What isn't gonna work is a single system that says it's bus and always bus. We have to figure out ways to interconnect the different modal options. So we're running out of time, but Carl, I wanted to get to one thing. A lot of people say that they will not ride the bus because I can't ride the bus. I have kids. How am I supposed to do it? But you do it. Yeah. How? Well, I'm privileged to live in a central location where I can walk and I have access to a lot of stuff on foot, where our family has access to a lot of stuff on foot, except our grocery store, Red Apple, which just closed. Uh, but I think part of it is that we already didn't have a car when we had kids. So we just integrated them into our lives. It got, uh, we had a foster son for a short time and he was reunified with his family, but uh, having three made it really, uh, I think it kind of put us over the edge. But we, we walk to school, we walk to a lot of things, and we try to keep our day-to-day -day life really local, and then we, we go on bus adventures for fun. <laughs> uh this is for any of you. People are, um, probably you, Deputy Mayor, um, people are frustrated with the uh, price and pace of sound transit. Is there any way to speed that up to get to some of the, you know, increasing demands that we have here? It's one of our top priorities. I mean, uh, I, I will tell you a day doesn't go by where the mayor doesn't ask that question of oh, really? what can we be doing to speed this up? And I know those timelines seem painfully long. Uh, but, you know, we want to make sure we get it right because they're 100 year investments. And, uh, you know, I think that we have to find the right balance of what she asked this of, in other me, words, who? Me. You. <laughs> What's your answer? What's your answer? Uh, my answer is uh, we are working very hard with Sound Transit <laughs> to make it happen. But, but seriously, though, have I they think given you any indication that, you know, something could be so faster? So here's or anything what's like that? going to be different, right? Is that I, uh, we have in the city, and this is a little wonky, so bear with me, we have uh, teams of departments working together, right? So it's no longer the Department of transportation over here, department and neighborhood over here, there's a full team that's saying, okay, the permitting, the land use, the neighborhood engagement, the where the stations are going to go, how are we going to work together to figure that out, and then work with Sound Transit uh, that we can get to a place that by early next year, we will have determined basically the alignments and the stations for the downtown segment, West Seattle, Ballard, uh, which is an incredible timeline. It sounds like a long time, but you know, I'll give you Bellevue's example. They took six years Speaking to get time, that point. I'm out of it. Okay, you're out of it. <laughs> uh, we have been talking about uh, transportation here with Deputy Mayor Shafali Ranganathan, Rob Gannon of Metro Transit, and the bus chick, Carla Salter. Civic Cocktail will take a vacation and return in the fall. Thanks for watching and have a lovely summer. Thank you. Thank you.